Ibrahim Thiel, UN Assistant Secretary General and Deputy Executive Director of the UN Environment Program, UNEP. Mr. Ibrahim Thiel, please. Your Majesty, Queen Noor of Jordan, Excellencies, all protocols observed, and dear friends from the Zaid Foundation, we are very proud to see you organizing this great event. Ladies and gentlemen, for the next few days, these halls will be full of discussions on policy priorities and private sector engagement. I would like to draw your attention to four main areas of South-South cooperation that I think have not been highlighted enough. Agriculture, water management, green economy, and food and nutrition. Let me start with agriculture. But let me start by telling you about a young Nigerian entrepreneur called Olawale Oje. Olawale has a certificate in sustainable integrated farming systems from Benin. He divides his time between working for a seed company, running his own business to provide support services to all small agriculture business and startups, and volunteering for the Young Professionals for Agriculture Development and the Nigeria Alliance for Science. But Olawale isn't just a very energetic, determined young man. He's a great example of how South-South cooperation helping to accelerate social, economic, and environmental development. Because the Songhai Center where Olawale studied is a result of partnership between Zambia and Benin to encourage agricultural partnerships, so people like Olawale now spread the benefits of that cooperation right across the region. In fact, as the, as the pace of South-South cooperation gathers force, it is becoming very clear that it has the potential to transform the world. Look at the trade among developing countries. Between 1990 and 2010, although trade within the same region declined, imports and exports between developing countries grew from around 40 to nearer 50 percent. However, the real value of South-South cooperation reaches far beyond trade and finance. And this brings me to my second item, which is water. If you take the mighty Mekong River, flowing over 5,000 kilometers through Cambodia, China, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. As the economy artery of Southeast Asia, it hosts the world's largest inland fisheries, worth up to $4 billion a year. And it nourishes rice fields and garden farms worth nearly $5 billion a year. So the Mekong River is actually contributing for $9 billion a year to the economy. So any change in climate change or water resources has huge implications for the entire region, but also for the 60 million people whose, li whose livelihoods depend on it. People like Chon Hai and Nu Sohoi, who grew rice near the Mekong, about 100 kilometers from Pranten. Every year, they must grow enough to feed their families, to replant the following year, and to sell for costs like rent, fertilizers, and loans. The production cycle used to be six rainy months, then six dry ones. Now the rains come later and later. Th that leaves the rice underwater for too long and too late. At best, people like Nu end up paying the rent with food, borrowing money to eat, and sending their children away to earn cash for the rest. At worst, as John well testified, it it can mean watching for house floods, your crops down, and your children die for disease. My third example is green economy. It is a great example how government can work together. You should not be surprised if I tell you that middle income countries are driving the green economy agenda with clean technologies, green finance, integrated water, waste, water, waste management, integrated wastewater management, and mass transit systems. Indeed, countries like China, 
Morocco, and many other here in the Middle East, such as the UAE, are leading the world on renewable energy technologies. Just last week, Dubai hosted a green finance conference. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know where the most innovative ideas on green finance are coming from, go to Sao Paulo, Johannesburg, Singapore, or Shanghai stock exchanges. While air pollution is one of the biggest mass murderers in the world, with seven million people dying every year due to the silent killer, especially in the global south, any lasting solution will have to take into account transport systems. Curitiba in Brazil is doing just what is needed. Thanks to an integrated urban planning, nearly half of all journeys are on public transport. Less cars means less congestion, less pollution, and less fuel. About 13 times less fuel and 11 times less con congestion than Sao Paulo. Today, roughly 85% of Curitiba uses the bus rapid transport system. My fourth example is in the area of food and nutrition. In the health sector, let us take a look at Argentina's successful Pro Huerta. It encourages local communities to produce fresh, organic food for a more nutritious diet, as well as helping about 3.5 million Argentinians. The system has been adopted by other countries, including Brazil, Colombia, Guatemala, and Venezuela. That is already a great example of South-South cooperation. But Haiti has taken the model even further, thanks to support from Argentina and Canada. Good nutrition and a good immune system go hand in hand. So when Argentina was hit by a cholera outbreak in the 90s, the Pro Huerta networks helped to educate people about the disease, food handling, and water and farm management. With Pro Huerta already in place, Haiti was able to follow that example when faced with cholera in the year 2010. Over 90% of the people taking part have a better diet, better health, and have the food costs. In conclusion, let me say that either whether in Haiti, in Brazil, in Benin, or the half of dozen countries in the Mekong, dropping that one pebble of partnership creates a massive ripple effect and tackles a whole range of social, economic, and environmental problems. So ladies and gentlemen, since this expo took place for the first time in 2008, the level of engagement from developing countries and from the private sector has grown steadily. The UN Environment Program witnessed the robustness of this partnership when we hosted the expo in Nairobi in 2013. So for the next few days, we must grab these opportunities with both hands. We must, we must take some bold decisions and build real momentum for lasting change. The futures of Shom, Nu, Olawale, and millions of others like them around the world depend on it. Thank you very much.